I've been a horse trainer for over 15 years. In that time, I had a lot of life changes that inspired me to look a little bit deeper into the gaps that I believe are in this industry and the way we interact with our animals. Found is that they have been huge in being able to help people shift their perspective, completely shift their energy, and really thrive in their relationships. Hey everybody, welcome to today's episode of Mirror in the Stall. This is Lucky Phillips, and he is coming to chat with me today. As always, I stumble across the people that I know I need to have conversations with, and I just reach out <laughs> out of the blue. Hey, do you want to talk to me? And he agreed to, so I'm super excited. Welcome, welcome. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so I know we've been chatting a little bit before this, and I'm super excited to talk to you because I feel like so many of the things that you say and that I read resonate in such a deep level for me in like horse world and like people humanness land too so I love um being able to use these like lessons that we learn with our horses and help people realize that they can take them into their real life too and improve the relationships with the people around them and themselves um mm. so what I don't know is how did all of this horse stuff start for you? Mm. Mm. So um, I come from into horses from a really unusual direction. Not totally unusual. There are other people similar to me, but um, I don't have a typical like pathway into horses. Um, all I know is that I've always loved horses and um, I as soon as I remember having memories, I knew what a horse was and I remember just loving them. And my first like imaginations of horses was of a horse free, not tacked, running, being in its natural environment. I never sort of dreamed of showing horses or like a certain discipline with horses where some people get really fixated in that. My first memories of horses and ways I would think about them and imagine them as children was just them as a species I just think they're like kind of the perfect animal mm -hmm. they're beautiful it's like how did you get here on this planet mm -hmm. and like we can work with you and like like ride you and you're okay with that it's kind of amazing and I've never really lost that really naive awe and wonder and I'm really proud of that if I'm allowed to be I'm quite proud that I've not lost that I've never become jaded um, but I grew up in um, suburban Melbourne, Australia, and um, I sort of had two things in my life that sort of dominated my life. And one of them was horses and the other one was dance. And um, in suburban Melbourne, there's a distinct lack of equestrian environments uh, unless I lived further out into the bush. And even then you would have to have a huge amount of money or have horses at home. And my, my auntie, she lived in the bush and she had horses and I used to spend a lot of time up there. So I would plan my entire uh, spring, summer, autumn, winter holidays, planning around asking my auntie if I could ride her angry little Shetland pony or her <laughs> Appaloosa schoolmaster. Like I was just completely obsessed and I'd spend hours with them in the paddock. But then as I sort of grew up, dance kind of took over and, um, Apparently, I was good at it and I had the right body, I had some talent there. So I um, took over my life and um, found myself at age 18 moving from Australia to Switzerland, where I graduated from the Zurich University of the Arts, from the Dance Academy of Zurich. Um, all kind of like classical ballet and like contemporary dance, the whole thing to like the highest level as I could do it, I did it. And then I worked in Germany in a state theatre for one year. And then I ended up in Poland uh, working for the Polish National Ballet. And I worked there for seven years. And um, it's like the largest opera house in Europe. It's got an enormous state. Like it was kind of a big deal. And um, though I never became a famous dancer, I was sort of the first Australian to work there. And it's a really exciting time. 
But as soon as I found myself in Poland with a steady career, it was sort of like, now I've got all this spare time and no one prepared that, prepared me to have spare time yeah. as a dancer. They yeah. said, you're going to be working so hard, so hard. But what they don't tell you is that when you start the career, you do a lot of like sitting around and waiting or you don't have rehearsals because you're new. And I had all this spare time. I don't have, didn't have family, didn't have friends. And I'm in Eastern Europe on the other side of the world by myself. And I was like, no, no, I can't spend the next however many years I'm in this career planning my weekends around going to the supermarket. I've got to do something else with my life. And by the way, it's a short career anyway. So I should start preparing like now for the next career. So I had remember, I remember having that conversation with myself in my apartment. And I was like, well, Lucky, what did you love before? dance dominated everything and first answer immediately was horses and I just spent a summer in in Spain before I moved to Poland and I spent some time at a ranch in Spain and that was kind of like okay this is amazing horses are back in my life how am I going to make this work how am I going to make this work and I was so excited because I really felt like I knew nothing like as a child your pure instincts with horses and it's all kind of feels kind of easy but then when you're an adult, it's kind of like, oh, my God, I don't know anything about this. And that was so exciting for me. So I dove into it head first, and pretty quickly I got really lucky and I found um, an amazing family run stable in sort of central Poland um, that you know, a small herd of horses, family orientated, and they talked about being gentle to horses. Cause I tried like the local riding schools in Warsaw and it was all kind of, the horses are tied down and all this kind of nonsense and they were kicking and pulling and all this stuff. And I just thought, this isn't my vibe. Like it's not, I already knew as an adult, I was like, I get to choose my education with horses. Now I didn't get to choose my teachers in dance. They were put on me. I get to choose how I want to do this with horses. And I want to do it differently this time. Because in my head, dancing and being with horses was already super connected and I never had to question that. But I spend a lot of my time now explaining to people that connection, happy to do so. But that was always kind of clear to me and I ended up sort of looking into it and I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to like hurt horses to like use them. I don't want to like go to competitions with them. I really just want to enjoy them and learn how to communicate with them and understand them. So I found this stable and they reached out and they said, why don't you come this weekend? So I was like, okay, I did. And the rest was history. And I just completely loved it. And I started off as a client there. And then I think after like my third or fourth visit, I was going just about every weekend. And after my third or fourth visit, I went to pay them for the visit. And they said, we don't want your money. I was like, no, 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 I have to pay you. Like, we don't want your money. So they stopped accepting payment from me. And they said, we see that you've got something whatever you want to call that, a talent, a gift, whatever. You see, you've got something with horses. And more than that, you've got like a passion and a love for them. And we want to like, they took me under their wing and they gave me this education with horses over sort of a five-year span. And I spent a lot of time up there. And um, yeah, and then I graduated as a trainer under their program uh, and instructor. And then for a number of years, I was working in the theater as a professional classical ballet dancer. And in my spare time, I had the second job as instructor and trainer. And then I was doing some stuff with saddles as well. So I was sort of doing the two things for quite a while. And then the horse business started to really take off. And I came to this quite uncomfortable, but really honest realization that I had, as a person, I had more to offer horses than what I could offer in a career in dance. I had more to do there. So considering I'd sacrificed everything in my life for dance, that was kind of like, oh, okay, hmm. <laughs> major pivot moment. But I wasn't afraid of it. I just sort of went, okay. And financially, I no longer needed the job in the theatre anymore because the horse side of my life was fully supporting me at that point. And along all of this way, I was also spending summers, every summer in Spain, working with horses up here on a ranch in the mountains where I live now. So I was coming here on holiday for quite a long time. Fell in love with one of the horses out here. I bought him, took him back to Poland. And 
the year that I took him back to Poland and started retraining him at the same time that that was happening, my career in dance came to a logical conclusion and I resigned from the job there for a number of reasons. And then I was like, okay, full-time horses. So I've been full-time with horses since 2018, since um, June, July, 2018, I've been full-time with horses. And um, yeah, since then we moved, me and my partner, we moved from Poland to Spain because the situation in Poland politically became like super, super, untenable and unstable um and being who we are as a couple and me being a foreigner and a business owner we just weren't safe there so um the plan was always to move to spain we just sort of moved here five years sooner than we really wanted to um but we're here now and yeah and horses are my full-time job and my full-time passion and who knows what's going to happen in the future but i'm i'm fairly certain that this will be my life's work whatever that's going to mean yeah yeah what you said about how you explain the connection between um dance and the horses what does that look like there's a number of levels to this answer there's like a really shallow answer and then there's a much deeper answer and then there's like the almost woo woo answer but i'll give you all three levels if i can i remember when i started getting back into horses in a big way my family back in australia when they would have family gatherings or family lunches or christmases or whatever they'd all sit around and they'd talk about the only person in the family who wasn't there anymore which was me they'd say oh what's lucky up to what's he doing and my family kind of mentioned well he's kind of like riding horses now and dancing and people were like what like how did that happen like that's so weird And my uncle, the husband of my auntie who had the horses when I was growing up, he's a fence builder. And like, all he does is like drink beer, grow his mustache and like not talk, (laughs) like real, like Aussie guy, really straight up and down Aussie guy. And um, he spoke up and he said, oh, I don't know. Sounds kind of logical to me. It's all just balance and timing and movement. Mm. And the whole family was kind of like, Oh, you know, he just saw so logically (laughs) that kind of shallow connection in that way that it's just, yeah, it's balance, it's timing, it's movement, it's coordination in terms of riding. And then in terms of like on the ground and like relating to a horse, it's about body language. It's about unspoken communication, which is essentially what dance is. And I mean, my whole career, most of my, my, my colleagues um, in dance, English was their second, third, fourth language, if they spoke it at all. And yet I had full on relationships with people who did not speak English and I didn't speak Russian or Belarusian or Ukrainian or Polish. And yet we would sit there and have these long conversations. I can't tell you how we communicated. We would have like a, a, a mutual repertoire of maybe 10 words and then body gestures and then a whole lot of feel but we would have these friendships and these communications. And I could tell you so much about their character, about their history, about the way they trained, about the way they thought about movement just by watching them move. So from the beginning with horses, like I remember from one of my first lessons, I was watching someone else in a lesson and I was just sitting there watching and I said, oh, the horse feels way more comfortable with her than she did with that rider. And my instructors were like, how did you how did you see that i'm like well it's just the same thing as dancing you're just reading body language all the time and not just um physical action in body language because body language goes is way more sophisticated than that because you can perform exactly the same dance step in the same technical capacity as someone else and yet one person will express it one way and another person will express it in another way and will have a totally different effect to the audience or to the watcher. And it's the same with horses. When you really make technical applications in horsemanship so, so simple so that we're not like some classical riders, they agonize over the position of your little finger and where is your shoulder and where is your hip? And they agonize all over these small details. But if you make all of that really simple and keep the techniques really simple, then you can have a horse who will respond to one person in one way and another person in another way with exactly the same physical action. 
So for me, it's kind of like, okay, what is that? That is really interesting to me in a horse that with the same physical behavior from the trainer or the horse person, whatever, the horse will respond to one person and won't to another. That's really interesting to me. So I'm like, okay, there's something going on here that's more than technique and my world from dance really helped me kind of transcribe this and relate this to people. Um, on a more like deeper level than that, on an emotional level, I mean, you've seen some of those Hollywood movies about the dance industry, right? Um, and some of the, the cultural problems, let's say, that the dance industry has in terms of the way they uh, treat people, the way they train people, the coercive nature, the abusive nature of how they treat and train people. And though I've not lived in a Hollywood movie, I've been there and I've come back out the other side and I can report that this is all true, that I don't know a mm -hmm. single I don't know a single female dancer in the classical ballet world that hasn't had a problem with food or her body image. I don't know one, not one. Um, I haven't met a single dancer that hasn't on some level experienced or currently lives with some version of doors to legal shutdown. I don't know one, including myself. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't met a single teacher who on some level uses manipulative or coercive techniques in order to train and teach the students. And these students, they'll be everything from 11 years old to 18 years old, but they're children. Mm -hmm. And these teachers, they might have been really great dancers uh, and really skilled artists. And that was all the qualification they needed to get a job as a teacher in a ballet school. Mm -hmm. They don't didn't have any education upon how to treat young people, how to train young people, uh, appropriate interactions with young people, uh, how not to abuse and psychologically torment young people. So I've experienced all of that. And if you think what a dancer is, a dancer is a creature that moves, that performs movement because they're told to and they're paid to, they're mm -hmm. supposed to, that's their job. Yeah. Someone tells you, move like this, and that's what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to not just to perform, but to overperform on a consistent and regular basis. And you're not allowed to speak up. You're not allowed to have a voice. And you're not allowed to talk. And you're conditioned um, in most ballet schools. In Australia, that was not my experience. Australia is way further ahead with these things. But in Europe, very different. So you're a creature of movement that can't talk. Mm -hmm. And you're working with psychos <laughs> who are in charge of you mm -hmm. and tell me in what way that doesn't relate to how a lot of horses live their lives mm -hmm. so from the beginning when I met at my school in, in in Poland that would always take in troubled horses and I would meet them and they would say this horse was in a dressage yard and it became unmanageable or this horse was jumping and it had huge shutdown issues. I would look in their eye and I'm just like, babe, I've been there. I know exactly yeah. how you feel. I know exactly how you feel. And based upon that empathy, I was immediately able to meet their needs without me being confused about firstly trying to understand their responses. I already understood their responses and their motivations or lack of. And I understood exactly what they needed physically, emotionally, somatically, mm -hmm. um, and practically as well. Mm -hmm. So I was able to kind of just meet their needs. And then I was that annoying guy in the stables or the equestrian environments I was at where they'd be like, how does he do that? I was that guy. You know that one that you just want to punch him because he would take the horse and just get along with them. Or someone would be like, oh, I can't catch this horse. And I just walk out there and the horse walks up to me and I'm just, <laughs> just catch them. And they just want to like slap your teeth out. I was that annoying guy because um, it wasn't confusing to me. Now, I'm not saying I understand all horses. That's not the case. Um, but boy, did my career in dance really give me a leg up here. Yeah. I mean, really. Mm -hmm. And I've yet to even begin mining that in horsemanship. I've just, I've just put a toe in the water of what mm -hmm. I can do in terms of transcribing those experiences those understandings and awarenesses into a horsemanship format and going forwards with it that's a three the three leveled answer for you <laughs> there's good. the shallow answer there's like the the middle answer then there's like 
the really full on answer. Right. Mm. Yeah, I like what you said about, um, and I talk about this, um, two people being able to do the same physical cues mm. and ask the horse and it looks like it's exactly the same and they get two totally different responses. And what 100%. I said, yeah. And I started asking people, how do you feel about what you're requesting from the horse? If it's like a boundary, you know, oh, I feel mean. I don't, you know, it's almost like that energy mm. that you hold about your beliefs about what you're asking, whether or not you feel like mm. you're worthy of their response or you can actually get it done. Or I would say, I feel like that is actually more significant than the physical cue that you're giving is how you feel currently about. 100%. Yeah. yeah 100%. So I get into a lot of conversations with people about this topic and others. And I, I hold space for the magic people and the science people at the same time. I really mm-hmm. have time for both, both sides of it because I don't see it as different camps. I see us all as one big soup. Yeah. So, and when I talk with like, quote unquote, the science people for want of a better term, they often take a reductionist approach to understanding that phenomena. They'll say, well, you know, whatever's going on in your psychology subconsciously will have uh, automatic, uncontrollable, teeny, teeny reductionist mm-hmm. response in your body physiologically. Like, you mm-hmm. know, your heart rate, one person's heart rate might be higher than the other person, even though they're doing the same arm movement, or whatever. So they take a reductionist approach to explain that and say, horses can read that level of minutiae sort of at this, at like lightning speed without any kind of conscious intervention it's like subconscious to subconscious immediate communication Mm -hmm. and that is one way of describing it and I think that's true but Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the end of the answer (laughs) I don't think it's the end of the answer I think there's a lot more going on Mm -hmm. and when you start kind of getting into the sciencey stuff of it which I like you know I'm not like hardcore I am a nerd so I like to pick these things up but I also like put them down and then just go and be with my horses right um but once you kind of get into that it's kind of really interesting to see that a lot of the science we have that comes out of even operant conditioning a lot of the effective neuroscience stuff which is where I really did a lot of my research what is that the first things they say is we don't have all the answers it's like trying to study the cell Mm -hmm. without having the microscope we just lack the tools scientifically to study some of this phenomena and even some of these these really well respected scientists will go ahead and explain the areas where science is really well illuminated and really detailed and really comprehensive and they'll explain that in great depth and then they'll say and connected to this is this entire dark zone where we know something is happening but we don't know what it is yet Now, some people will look at that and say, well, if it's a dark zone, it means there might be nothing there. Uh, And again, we can kind of relate this back to the whole religion aspect. Is there life Mm -hmm. after death? You know, because we don't have the information, it means it doesn't exist, right? And maybe that's true. But um, I've had way too many kind of miraculous coincidences in my life to kind of go ahead and say that there's nothing more to this life than just particles and energy. There's something else going on. And if I can find a science adjacent way, a rational way to explain the irrational, I will, Mm -hmm. if I can. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of kind of avoiding those scientific dark zones and sticking only to what's known and only within operant conditioning sphere, I'll go into operant conditioning and say, yep, 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 all of that. Then let's dive into that dark zone together and kind of find our way through it. It's a little bit like, going to like nail a box in the dark with a hammer you don't know where the nails are but you've got a tool and you're kind of flailing around in the dark (laughs) trying to figure it out but every now and then by pure feel you'll kind of hit onto something and it works Mm -hmm. and then by body memory and by feel again you can start to develop a pattern and so you might be in a scientific dark zone but that doesn't mean you're not hitting on a consistent and real pattern that gets results. There might be no science around it, no studies to prove it, but that doesn't stop the fact that not only yourself, but your clients and loads of other trainers are hitting on a consistent pattern in the dark by pure feel and intuition. And there's something to that. 
Yeah. Is that not like the basis of science is like consistent results spread over a large like test subject base, which is basically what some of this woo stuff is doing. Mm-hmm. The thousands of people all over the world that are in the dark hitting on consistent patterns. And we've got thousands of breeds of horses and thousands of owners mm-hmm. all kind of getting the same result in the same way, all with different coaches, but we're all kind of going in a similar flow here. Mm-hmm. You know, I always kind of say that a lot of modern horse people, we're all talking about the same stuff, Mm -hmm. all with different language, different ways to describe it, but we're all talking about the same stuff here. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, that's really interesting to me, getting into those dark zones and kind of not being afraid of them. Yeah. Going off of what you were just talking about is mm-hmm. that I am I had started this group. I, I archived my old group that I'd had for like eight years or something because it was there was so much content in there that if I watched, I would literally cringe and be like, oh my God, I can't believe I was even doing that to horses. Mm. And nothing was like abusive, but is it now from my perspective, I'm like, oh God, that's like everything that I'm unwinding for horses. And so I archived it and we had certain days that um, had certain themes and we had picked Woo Wednesday, like Woo Woo Wednesday. And um, that. that's great. That's really to... good. Consider that stolen. Consider that <laughs> yeah. stolen. Yeah. But the best part about it was for my clients and the people that were like, well, let's, why is this, you know? And someone had said, because um, there's some judgment around Woo Woo, right? Like, oh, Woo Woo, whatever. And she goes, no, Wu, it was explained to me as wisdom openly observed. So Mm. it was like witnessing this higher knowing of something and this bigger thing that Mm. we couldn't explain necessarily, but it was like this wisdom that you had, this experience that you had was just observed. And it was Mm. like, oh, I can do that. Like, I like that. (laughs) And everybody was like, oh, we all like that. And it was just this like knowing of things or not knowing and just accepting it as, yeah, this is part of the human experience. Like you can't tell me that you think that everyone has figured all these little things out. And if you don't know that it doesn't exist, I'm like, that's ridiculous. This planet and this world and this human experience is so expansive. Like I refuse to shut it down if, you know, if there isn't a logical- One of my my friends on Instagram shared like a really good gif and it said something like, I might not get it completely verbatim. It said something like labeling your spiritual talents as woo woo is a trauma response. Mm, mm-hmm. So I think in that moment, what, what you guys did as a group was give yourselves permission to, to call it woo and mm-hmm. uh, to be okay with your spiritual gifts and your spiritual talents. Mm-hmm. Um, and spiritual might be loosely defined as anything which cannot yet, yet mm-hmm. be explained by science. But the really cool thing that happens is when some of this woo-woo stuff starts to get science to back it up. Mm-hmm. That's really exciting. Yeah. So like some of the work that was done on mirror neurons is super interesting and really exciting. So a lot of the work that Panksepp did, you know, all those years ago, super exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's cool. And we shouldn't be uncomfortable talking about these things. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 20, we've just had the great reset with COVID. Mm-hmm. If there wasn't a time to just go there now Mm -hmm. without shame like when is the time (laughs) in our lifetime Mm -hmm. so and that's something I spend quite a lot of time on with my clients particularly the people who come to me with for one-on-one coaching online is sort of delicately unpacking and deprogramming Mm -hmm. their inbuilt shame responses and I really think that shame is one of the biggest obstacles and blockages in terms of improving and getting really good with horses. Mm -hmm. If you've got any kind of internalized shame there, it's just going to block you, block you, block you, block Mm -hmm. you. And often I can't coach people on improving their technique until we deprogram that shame. I can get them to a certain point and then there comes a point where they just go round and round in circles and I either leave them where they are if they're not ready with love or 
I have to address it. And I have to mm-hmm. actually kind of say, hey, there's this sticky, uncomfortable thing we need to talk about. And like, what are you ashamed of? And like, if you aren't looking at the work you did six, 12 months ago, and you're not embarrassed on some level, mm-hmm. then you're just not growing. Mm-hmm. So like, I think part of that self-love and that self-respect and well, I call it shameless living Mm -hmm. is to look at who you were six, 12, 18 months ago. For some people it's 10 years ago. For me, it's six months ago because I'm on like a really steep learning curve still. Um, uh, It's like a roller coaster that just keeps on going up. I'm like, when's it going to drop? When's it going (laughs) to drop? Just keeps on going up. (laughs) Um, Stay tuned. (laughs) It'll drop eventually. (laughs) But um yeah, for me, it's six to 12 months ago. I'll look at the the coaching videos I made or the technique videos I made six to 12 months ago or kind of posts I was making six to 12 months ago. And even though the message there is still pure, still from my heart, still applicable, uh, there's still part of me that goes, oh, cringe, you know, mm-hmm. ooh, cringe. And if you're not, it means you're just not going forward. Right. So like, I'm radically okay with that. I'm radically okay with being embarrassed of who I was six, 12 months ago, 10 years ago. I'm radically okay with that. <laughs> and I'm radically okay with like poor choices from the past because without them, I wouldn't have gotten where I am today. Right. So I spent a lot of time on that with people kind of unpacking that. Some people really appreciate it and um, they're really able to kind of be like, huh, I've been like working with this, this thing it's like someone gives you a rock and puts it on your back and you agree silently to carry it for your entire life and it makes your life so much harder and the people or the society that gives you this rock to carry they will call it culture they will call it respect they'll call it manners they'll call it the status quo they'll call it the correct thing to do they'll call it Uh, whatever they want to call it. They dress it up as something that it's not, but in its core, it's shame or a version of it. And Mm -hmm. it's used to keep people down and to control them. It's still this like from medieval times, that's where it came from. It's this whole feudal empire concept of the aristocracy, the haves and the peasantry, the have nots. Mm -hmm. So we absorb this shame. And what it does is keep us in the dumps, keep us in the shit, keep us in the mud so that we can't rise up Mm -hmm. and step into our excellence and our power and our gifts Mm -hmm. because the the haves were violently and continue to this day to be violently uh defensive of their position of privilege and if they look around and see someone in their backyard somewhere figuring out pf without ever going to a classical dressage lesson they're completely threatened by that and they will attack that person for it. That's actually a real story. I once visited when I was doing sort of saddle fittings for a while. Um, I visited all kinds of places and this was, I did it in Poland and in Latvia. Um, I visited huge like dressage barns with 18 hand gleaming Dutch warm bloods. And I visited like people in their backyards that had like a shaggy Shetland pony. I visited the whole sort of spectrum of horse owners and I remember I met this girl in the sort of rural outskirts of Krakow and she had this totally eccentric family they ran this ethnographic museum with like this their whole upstairs attic was it was built into this kind of fairyland with puppets and trees they'd made out of and and they like take like school kids up there and teach them about pagan fairy tales and stuff like they were just it was like something out of a book and there she was with her two horses in the backyard and she's like oh I've been with horses for like less than two years and I've taught my two-year-old how to do PF in hand and I was like sorry Mm -hmm. and she showed me she's like yeah we were like trotting and then I realized that his hind legs were like way too out behind him and he was struggling to balance so I asked him to like trot but stand still at the same time and he just (laughs) PF'd and I was like because she was totally not programmed in any kind of shame-based Mm self-reflection. She had not been spoiled by the local kick pull riding school. She hadn't been frightened or intimidated by the haves, the equestrian aristocracy. She hadn't Mm -hmm. been frightened or intimidated by them. She just figured it out and Mm -hmm. her horses loved her. 
and she would just like jump on them and she had no arena she just had like this garden and like open fields and there she was schooling them like beautifully and I was just like oh wow like it was so mind opening for me to see that you don't have to go the pathway everyone else has gone in order to get to where you want to go even if we're all going to the same place there are so many roads to Rome and all of them can work Mm -hmm. this is controversial but including the pathways of abuse Mm -hmm. they quote work like Mm -hmm. the the horsemen and women that used to or maybe still do tie colts to concreted poles and blindfold them and tie up their legs cast them on the ground and sack them out until they give up which we now see as outdated and abusive practice and reprehensible in my opinion they still had at the end of that journey with that horse when that horse turned 20 or whatever Mm -hmm. and retired they still had a horse that neighed to them and whinnied to them at the gate Mm -hmm. when they came to get them they still had a horse that go out on the range and do a job with its ears forward and be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was some level of dorsal vagal shutdown involved. There would have to be, but they still got a relationship with that horse, even though they went through that Mm -hmm. awful procedure. So that's a really contentious subject. And a lot of people are going to hate me for it. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not advocating or supporting those methods at all. Mm -hmm. Just like you wouldn't say, you know, parents that used to whoop their kids still had kids that loved them when they passed away, right? right? Mm -hmm. But we now know that it's an outdated and ineffective parenting practice to whoop Mm -hmm. your kids. Right. So that's maybe also contentious in some parts of the world. Some people still believe I have the right to beat my kids if I want to Mm -hmm. or to smack them or whatever. So I'm not advocating that, but I'm saying that all pathways can kind of get to the same place Mm -hmm. on some level. So you are allowed to take any pathway you want. But if people are coming to me for coaching and I see you whooping horses, I want nothing to do with you. And I will tell you that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, When I talked to Tara, we had that chat about um, a lot of who at what point decided what was right and what was wrong and made these Uh rules that all these people are um, falling to. And I look at, even with, you know, school, like my younger son is now homeschooling because I'm looking at this, like they have this set of rules that they've made and this is what a good student looks like. And if you fall on the outside of that, then you must have some type of learning disability or you might, you know, need to be medicated or whatever. And it was like, no, like who Mm -hmm. decided what school was supposed to fucking look like and who decided, Mm. you know, these beings that are here to not conform to that all of a sudden there's something wrong with them. It's so crazy. And when I was talking to Tara, she does a lot of Liberty stuff. And she was like, you know, I'm at Liberty. And maybe when my horse is offering me this amazing pee off or passage, it doesn't look technically like it's supposed to. She's like, but my horse is expressing itself freely and loving the movement and how it feels in her body and why is someone making that wrong so it's yeah it's Mm. so crazy when you start to look i think a lot of that depends on like the whole concept of correct and incorrect and these these rules we impose in ourselves it all depends upon what end goal you're going for so a lot of these rules obviously come from well competitive horse world where there are there is a rule book that says it has to look like x y and z and people who are attempting to go in that direction are trying to conform to those rules so that's where that comes from and then before that when horses were used in war or industry there was a very direct and specific result that the industry or job required and so there was correct and incorrect and the correct was whatever served the end job result and incorrect was whatever didn't so for some people um if their end result is a horse that connects with them and plays with them and enjoys them and feels safe with them then they too have a long list of what is correct Mm -hmm. and um they'll have a long list that's incorrect as well including the reverse of that is like people who try to make their horse fit certain molds they'll say that's incorrect Mm -hmm. and sometimes I was thinking about this today as I was mucking out 
where all of my major life decisions and mm. awareness has come from. Absolutely. It's from mucking out, yeah. mucking out <laughs> or long distance driving is where yes. I sort my head <laughs> out. And I'm going to have, when I've got the time, I'm going to start my own podcast and it's going to be called Muck Out With Me, where oh. we do just that. We just so, like come together and sort our, sort our shit out. But mm-hmm. I was thinking about this today and I was like, if aliens came to earth and they understood our verbal languages but they didn't know anything else and they just observed equestrian culture (laughs) what would be their awareness of that Mm -hmm. and in some ways I do feel like a little bit like that alien I'm an alien my entire adult life I've been an immigrant my whole life Even growing up in Australia, the country with enormous toxic masculinity problems, growing up as a young queer kid in Melbourne, it was kind of like, I'm a constant outsider. I'm a constant alien in my own culture. So I was like, if I'm going to be an alien in my own culture, bye, Felicia, (laughs) I'm going to Europe. So that's what I did. And so I've been a constant kind of alien everywhere I've been. I'm both participating in the cultures I'm surrounded by, but I'm not one of them. Mm-hmm. I can jump in the pool with them, but that doesn't make me the same fish as them, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, with equestrian culture, I'm very much that way because I don't come from a horsey family. I never competed. I'm not interested in that. I've never come from a specific horsey culture. And when I have found myself in a specific horsey culture and it started to get a bit culty, I was like, oh, yeah, I took myself out of it. Yeah. And what I find really fascinating is these human constructs people make up around horses Mm -hmm. and it is a made up human construct Mm -hmm. for example in a really shallow and crass way this example Mm -hmm. um i've heard some of my friends back home in australia who all have warm bloods and amateur dressage aspirations they'll say oh this horse is too tall for me or this horse is too short for me and i'm just like okay like what (laughs) and then like you see these um you know, 120 kilo cowboys on 14 (laughs) hand Arabians and quarter horses. And they don't have any problem with that. And they swamp these horses in tack and human flesh and (laughs) they work all day. And then you go to Scandinavia and you see nothing less than 17 hands with like a five foot four (laughs) dressage lover. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, the horse is a bit small for me. And I'm just like, (laughs) that I don't get. That I don't get, and that's really interesting for me. I mean, maybe my horse is slightly too short for me because of my leg length and he's kind of compact, but that hasn't stopped us, you know, and I don't really care about how tall a horse is or what they look like or what tack you have Um, and all these kind of human constructs that you've got to have, you know, in certain cultures, you've got to have a black saddle and matching wraps and saddle pads and the bonnet and the You've got to have the diamantes and you've got to have the flash nose band and sometimes even also the martingale and you've got to ride on a contact. Mm-hmm. You've got to look a certain way and the horse has to look a certain way. And I'm just kind of like, that's a human construct, guys. Like that, that's not excellence. That's a human construct. Mm-hmm. And same deal in the Western world. You have peanut rollers on the buckle or no buckle, or whatever, head all the way down, <laughs> kind of not really moving mm-hmm. in a certain kind of saddle, looking a certain kind of way. And people are just desperate desperate to identify Mm. and to belong somewhere and I get it I get it I'm not one of them I don't care if I really belong to big groups I just want to belong have a sense of belonging to myself and the horses I work with um but and there's no shame in that either Mm -hmm. but we got to be aware of it that if you're participating in a really specific equestrian culture have enough self-awareness to know that you're identifying with a human construct here, not necessarily directly to the horse, capital T H, the horse. Mm-hmm. And don't take that so seriously. Mm-hmm. So if you're into dressage, don't take that so seriously that you then forget it should be about the horse. Don't take the competition so seriously that you steamroll the horse in the process. Mm-hmm. So don't take bitless so seriously that you steamroll others and the horse in the process. So all of these things, don't take it so seriously in that sense Mm -hmm. and um yeah i just find that really fascinating all these kind of human constructs and what i really look for when i'm looking for people 
to inform me or educate me or mentors or guidance or people I can collaborate with as a professional, certain things I look for. And one of them is someone who deliberately crosses the wires in human constructs around horses. So I saw pictures of a show jumper riding in a Bosal and a Makati rain. And I was like, you are interesting to me. Tell me how you got to that place. Or like someone in all of the dressage regalia, but they're in a neck rope and the horse was trained in the neck rope, trained in the neck rope. I'm like, tell me more about that. Or the the crazy hardcore bitless person who's having a lesson in a bit. I'm like, talk to me. I want to know, let me pick your brain, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, that's why I do, I really respect uh, Unbridled Goddess Tara, for example, because mm-hmm. she's the, you know, the the dreadlocks and the liberty and the whole human construct around that. Mm-hmm. And she was at like a full on dressage competition, yeah. like just a week ago. And yeah, I'm like, really that, well. <laughs> that is interesting for me. So those kinds of people really kind of fascinate me. And I wish more people felt comfortable enough in themselves to do that Mm -hmm. or felt confident enough to take the pushback that Mm -hmm. will come your way Mm -hmm. when you do that right and I think the reason why more people don't step outside of these human constructs around horses is because of the the vile human Mm -hmm. nauseating Mm -hmm. patronizing bullying that will come your way Mm -hmm. when you are different Right. in an equestrian environment that's why more people don't I think yeah could be wrong yeah mm. I think that's why I like finding those people and then bringing them on here and having those conversations so people it almost gives people permission to have those both because why can people come here from you know I have 3d adventures dressage writers I have a western pleasure person it doesn't change what we do and I always talk mm. about the base of you know, I started wanting to go to what is the actual issue versus the band-aiding of things in all aspects, like human body, horse performance, all the things. And, um, and I just kind of broke down, like, what is the base of every single performance issue that people are having? And it's just tension in the horse's body. If you don't Mm. work against not tension in the way that elasticity, but the tension of, you know, hardcore, I'm defensive, I'm not safe in my body. And I'm like, If you make a horse feel safe in their body and in your presence, you can literally ask them for anything and it just happens. Like the training technical Mm. stuff is not nearly as hard as you think it is. It's pushing Mm. through all of the resistance that makes it actually Mm. difficult. So Mm. just unwinding, where's the tension coming from? And can you Mm. sit and connect with yourself long enough to allow your horse the space to do the same thing? And I read something Mm. somewhere that you had written, um, talking about allowing the horse to feel and experience everything it needs to experience um Mm. and not take it well i don't know this is this maybe wasn't your thing but it aligned with the way don't take it personally yeah don't take it personally and also Mm -hmm. don't intervene with that cycle Mm -hmm, right let them let let them go through that cycle yeah Mm -hmm. yeah it's Mm. like what's mine is mine what's yours is yours and Mm. a huge thing that happened for me recently was um, giving myself permission permission to not be responsible for their healing or other people's mm. healing because mm. I feel like as a trainer and then it kind of unraveled mm. I did a clinic with Carrie Lake um, this summer and it was interesting because the work that I do you know and there was a bunch of trainers at this clinic and I brought my little red dragon that I have that I love and adore and he brings me all my lessons and he, I sent him off to training when he was a stud, when he was younger to get some consistency while I was going through my divorce. And he, um, is one horse that never shut down, refused to shut. He would fight, but will not shut down. Thank God, because Mm. that is what actually taught me so much about him and life. (laughs) And so I went to this Carrie Lake clinic and I, I, you know, I could have got on and I could have said, okay, let's work on this. And, you know, we look, we get by and I'm with peers and I'm like, how can I, how can I, you know, the ego would say, how can I look good in front of these people? So they see me as this legitimate trainer and X, Y, Z, but I really knew what would happen sometimes is I would go to halter him and he would just bolt. And I was like, I help people with this. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. 
but what was helpful for people was to see like, this is me and hit, this is the lessons that he is bringing. He, we have this, I always tell people the horses that end up in your life, it's almost like you have a soul contract with this other being. So they're bringing mm. these lessons for you. Um, mm. And so it was interesting because I said, you know what, if I'm coming into this clinic and she's going to work with me, I'm going to do what I know is going to make me feel the most naked. And that's sometimes I can't catch my fucking horse. I and I took that. the halter off and was like, sometimes, you know, we get right. And we had that story. I'm like, I help people break that story. I can't, I can't for myself. Like, what is it? And it all it spiraled back to that responsibility piece. She said, mm. you feel responsible. And I said, I release that for my clients. You know, I don't, I'm not here to make you feel comfortable. I'm here to create space for you to find this stuff out for yourself. We all have our own divine connection. I'm going to hold space for you and neutrality to do that. But I realized when I was out there is I wasn't doing that for the horses. And I felt like, well, if I'm not helping the horses, I, I'm, it's my responsibility to help them. I have, this is, and then I said, and I'd ask myself, what is it about that? And I said, well, if I don't, if I'm not here to help horses and like, why do I even exist? Like, what's the point of me? And my mm. identity was so tied into that. And mm. then she had just said, you have to under, you have to accept that they also have their own divine connection and mm. that is being worked with you. Same thing for the humans. And we sat out there and had this discussion while my horse was walking around and uh, we got to the end of it and it was this really crazy, amazing conversation around that and releasing responsibility and they have their own, you know, and you're just there to hold the space. And, um, and she goes, okay, now go catch your horse. And immediately I'm like, here we go. <laughs> and just, we talked, then we got to that responsibility piece and he, we know one videoed it, of course, but he walked right over and literally put his nose into the halter. He was like, yeah. finally, like stop carrying so much of that tension of, I have to help out all the things. Right. So it's so yeah. interesting to think compassion of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. That's compassion exhaustion which is sort of one of the major prerequisites for a burnout, mm -hmm. professional burnout, Right. that equestrian professionals, we need to get together in a community, question of professionals, interdisciplinary, we need to get together as a community without our clients mm -hmm. and we need to talk about professional burnout in this industry because toxic burnout culture in the equestrian community is hardcore awful. Right. Um, you're expected to work overtime for no pay and it's just yeah so there's that and then also hashtag relatable content because right you're like okay I can't catch my horse sometimes <laughs> and okay I'm one of you guys you know I've got my own struggles and that's really important and you like stepped into your vulnerability and that's where you're that's where everyone is able to relate to you and that's actually like where your where your power is and where your strength is and yeah, it's so important for me to to let horses be horses. I know that's such like a glib thing to say. Everyone, let horses be okay. What does that actually mean? It's more than just like a paddock and a nice ranch. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's honoring that they have their own cycles. And don't take this the wrong way, anyone listening. But how arrogant are we as a species to think we know what's best for them? Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of problem when I see things written like ignore the behavior you don't want and reward the behavior you do want. I'm like, well, who's just, that's really one-sided here. Like it's all about what you want from the horse. What about what the horse wants from this? You know, are you really sure you're clear on that? You know, I remember, I don't know why this story pops into my head while you were talking, but I want to relay it to you. So who knows what, what will come from it. But while you were talking, a, little, a memory came to me of not so long ago with my little rescue horse, Caleb, that came to me during, he was my coronavirus horse. Everyone has a coronavirus horse that came to them during the lockdown. <laughs> and, and, and he was mine. And um, his owner had passed um, just before the Spanish lockdown, the Spanish quarantine, his owner passed tragically in a horse related accident she was killed and found and she was a really professional horsewoman she once you know rode from spain to scotland like on her own right like like full on and she so she had this little rescue horse that she had really lovingly devoted 10 years to and when she had found him he had like maggots in his feet and he was totally neglected and he had been owned by a 
um, mentally disabled man who used to like molest him and like bang him and like twist his ears. And he was like left alone with this disabled person who really just like screwed him up mentally. Right. And I was told he hated men and he came to me anyway. And we're doing good now. And he's, he's all right. You know, he doesn't attack people anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but one day, not so long ago, I was taking him from night pasture into his stable for his breakfast something he had done several times and he's naturally suspicious and when he learns something he learns it so hyper specifically mm. that any deviation from that specific pattern is cause for concern right. so he's got no allostatic um ability he he has to be homeostatic which is part of his welfare problem he can't adjust and adapt to things he 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 has to be like this and so what I do instead of giving him that I actually slowly make micro adjustments in his routine and his environment so he doesn't get fixated mm -hmm. and doesn't exacerbate that problem but this particular day the farrier was here and was shooing and in between his box with his breakfast and where he was coming from was the farrier with the smoke and the van and the whole lot and he stopped and he went Oh no. And he like turned and ran away out of my hand, pulled the rope out of my hand. And my other horse, Sansom, was just with me going, okay, if he goes, I want my breakfast. And he just came with me. So I put one horse in, I went to go get Caleb and he went, no, no, I don't want to be caught. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try again. Mm -hmm. You know, using all my best body language tools, not to face up onto him, come in on a curve and not look him in the eye and all of those things we learned. Tried to catch him. No, I don't want to be caught. Don't catch me. Really offended. I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't have time for this today. And I just went, fine, do what you want. Do mm -hmm. whatever you need to do. Go hang out. Meanwhile, I'm giving you breakfast if you want it or not. And then um, after five minutes, he came back and kind of stood near the box, like mm -hmm. looking at me like this. I was like, are you ready now? are you ready i just talked to him in plain english i'm like are you ready now and he was kind of like yeah and I just walked up to him clipped the lead rope on and took him straight in. he was like sorry i'm ready now <laughs> I, I had a moment i had a moment i allowed him the moment i didn't punish him i didn't chase him off i didn't try to make the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard i didn't mm -hmm. try and reinforce anything i didn't try to train anything mm -hmm. i didn't try to fix anything I just let him have his movement. I gave him an opportunity to cooperate or not. He didn't want to. That's fine. Mm -hmm. You don't get your breakfast, but I'm not also withholding it from you either. You know that I'm here to facilitate you having your breakfast. He's <laughs> fully aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, just he was overwhelmed in that moment and triggered, and that's okay. He's allowed to be triggered. I'd be surprised if he wasn't. Right. So, yeah, I don't know why that, that memory came up in my head, but I thought I should tell it. <laughs> Yes, I feel like people get so um, hung up on, well, step one, two, three, four, we, mm. we've done this, so we shouldn't have to do that again. And if it happens again, mm. then we're somehow going backwards um, mm. or I'm somehow failing my horse. And I was like, this is not linear. Like, this is just right. the healing isn't linear. The learning isn't linear. Like, and it's so, it's been so big for people in the last month. And I just keep going back to it. You're just scraping away the layers and when it comes up again, it's almost like you just now they're ready to go deeper, right? So I'm like, stop mm. thinking about it forward and back, start thinking about they're feeling safe enough to really express how they feel. Because I feel mm. like when you get a horse in, even the people that buy new horses in there, this isn't the horse that I rode when I tried mm. it out. And then they get into a space where they feel safe to express themselves. And all of a sudden, these <laughs> behaviors that look very unwanted, the thaw. cycles that needed to the be the trauma thaw. Mm -hmm, that needed to be completed mm -hmm. are now showing up and I was like no it's great yeah like you stop looking yeah. at it as misbehavior they finally feel safe enough to communicate and we can clear all that and then you have mm. the actual horse that started out before all the shit you know and mm. so, um, mm. allowing mm. that is like a big it's like thing. the matrix mm -hmm. it's like a matrix red pill blue pill mm -hmm. you know that moment when you buy a horse that's in dorsal vagal shutdown mm -hmm. and when you bring them into a safe environment and the, they start to thaw and mm -hmm. everything comes out that's a crucible for a lot of horse owners. And mm -hmm. I respect both choices. I've been in that position when actually this was just before I moved to Spain. <clears throat> Sorry, just before I moved to Spain, I was working with a bunch of people in Poland and I had two particular clients at the time who both had shut down horses who at the same time, I reached a point with both these clients at the same time where their horses started to wake up. They started to thaw. Right. And all of this 
junk like Pandora's box started to come mm-hmm. to the surface and they're like what is happening to my horse and in these private lessons I both gave these different owners virtually the same explanation though slightly modified for their personalities I gave them the same explanations I'm like this is actually good mm-hmm. I know that's confusing I know that's counterintuitive but this is a good thing we have to go through this process I can't predict how long it's going to last it could be two weeks it could be 10 years I don't know but we need to hold space for them. We need to go through this. It's going to be okay. But you might need more of my help. Right. Right. Um, and one of them took one pill and they just said, no, too hard for me. And they called the local dressage instructor who gave them a stick, tap, 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 tap the horse until the horse went back into the shutdown. Mm-hmm. And they were then able to have um, a semblance of a peaceful relationship with their horse they could, within their busy lifestyle, they were able to ride their horse, go out with them, whatever. Nine times out of 10, every now and then they'd have a day where the horse was crazy and they were just like, oh, she was crazy today. And then they just didn't ride and they didn't think anything more of it. And the other one said, okay, I'm going to trust you. Let's go for it. Let's go into that deep place. And that other person still with me, like three years later, we're still working together. They're actually coming to visit me here in Spain next month. And the, the latest videos I've been getting from them because they've been doing on and off online coaching as well. The latest videos I'm getting from them and this horse, are like give me shivers and I'm, I'm like welling up when I watch it because I remember mm-hmm. what was happening, right. you know, two and a half years ago when the horse started to thaw and like now they got through it and they're on the other side and it's amazing. Really the grass is greener. Mm-hmm. There was some really interesting um, studies done on polar bears in the arctic um when they were tagging them for like ear radio pieces to you know record the population and they would tag them from the helicopters and they would be running and they would tranquilize them from the helicopters and they would go down running Mm -hmm. into a shutdown or a chemically induced shutdown and then as they woke up they woke up running Mm -hmm. So as they go into a shutdown, so they will come out of it. Mm -hmm. And the same is applicable for us with trauma and with horses Mm -hmm. that as you go into that shutdown, so you will come out of it. And you see this a lot when people process grief or the ending of a relationship Mm -hmm. for whatever reason, they might shut themselves down to it because they've got a function. They've got kids to raise. They've got a job to do. They, They don't have the luxury to grieve in this moment. But six to 12 months later, something so tiny or even nothing Mm -hmm. will trigger it. And it all comes to the surface and comes out six to 12 months, even years later. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's so important to know exactly like what you said, horse training is non-linear. I think though marketing directors are well-meaning in encouraging equestrian professionals to offer step-by-step programs to bring Mm -hmm. a higher yield, et cetera, I think they're well-meaning I think they fundamentally misunderstand the kind of work we're in when they advise us to create step-by-step programs you can do basic step-by-step programs but there's got to be some kind of complexity inbuilt into what we do and I often explain it instead of like a linear graph like this it's like an interconnected web of Mm -hmm. connections like like Mm -hmm. when you look at the brain and neural connections how everything's crossing over and everything connects like this in these infinitely 3d and complex ways which is why with horses, sometimes one plus one doesn't equal two. It can equal 43 because you're dealing with the infinite unknown here and something which is inherently chaotic and complex. And um, I think some of the trends we have at the moment in the modern horsemanship community, the ethical community, whatever you want to call us, to oversimplify or just simplify things I think it's well-meaning. I think it helps a lot of people, but I would like to see more trainers and professionals being comfortable to explain complexity to their clients Mm -hmm. and getting their clients up to speed with being comfortable with complexity Mm -hmm. because otherwise go do something else with your life. (laughs) Don't work with horses because if you want it to be a straightforward process or an easy process or a simple process, I mean, you've got really unrealistic expectations here. And let's not see the complexity as like a negative thing. Let's see this as something we should celebrate, Right? you know? 
Yeah. Maybe I'm idealistic. I don't know. I could be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just. I have a, I'm really sorry, but I have a cat who wants to be in the podcast oh, for a perfect. second. <sighs> <laughs> I love this cat, but he wakes us up at three o'clock in the morning because he wants to talk to us. So he wanted to talk to me. So here you are. You may or may not be on YouTube right now. And if you are, say hello. Yeah. But I'm going to put you down. I'm going to need you to not, not scream at me, okay? <laughs> okay. The cats always want to be involved. I feel like it's the dog. Yeah. The dogs are like, what are you doing? You're still, and they go back out. The cats are like, so what's going on? I'd like to have <laughs> this conversation all the time so funny yeah um so I, I mean we could I we could probably talk for hours but I just realized it's already 10 30 and we're like an hour and a half in so um <laughs> like I have to pick something to end on this is like okay let me think about this um because there's so many things um it I think one last little thing is how do you kind of explain describe um help people with the point of being, so when I work with horses, I'll just give an example. When I work with horses and I realize there's just stiffness in the body in certain spots and I'll describe it as they just have a story, the body being the unconscious mind, right? There's a running story. There's something that was kind of chronically going on or something that happened that caused this accumulation to like tell the, the body saying, it's not safe for me to be supple here. That line of being so um, being really patient and allowing the horse to work through stuff and spending, I feel like you could spend all your time there sitting, being for eternity, but it feels like there's always a point where if you're going to get them beyond that or through it, it looks like discomfort. It looks like the growth piece for us, for them. And I, this has come up recently for me. So it's like, well, I thought we were supposed to go to the threshold and then wait. And I said, yes, to a certain extent, right? You, you, you see, I see that you're worried about this. How much of a relationship do we have where I'm going to ask you to trust me now and get through the discomfort of this so that you can see it is not the same as it was before. Um, does mm. that make sense? It does. And I'm picking up what you're putting down. I really understand where you're going with this. Correct right. me if I'm wrong. But what I think, what I think you're trying to talk about is when it doesn't look pretty anymore, mm, when yeah. it doesn't look politically correct, mm -hmm. when the training doesn't look like how some people tell us it should look, mm -hmm. when there's an abundance of calming signals, mm -hmm. when things get ugly, mm -hmm. right? Which right. within our community, the modern horse people, community, whatever, that's become really kind of frowned upon mm -hmm. that the ears must be here and the eyes must have no wrinkles and the lips <laughs> must show no tension. And if you're not, then the trainer is instigating these things in a horse and you're taking them over threshold and that's irresponsible. And don't you know that you can, instead of doing that, you can do positive reinforcement with protected contact and take three years to fix that problem and never expose the horse to those, those physiological states. And I hear that and there's space for that. Um, but it's not the only way for it. Did I did I pick up what you're putting yes. down correctly? Yeah. It's okay. That, like, when do you decide? Like, I know that. Right. It's like it's almost teaching them resilience. Like this discomfort. Mm. Like, how can you're never going to be able to create an environment where everything is perfect? But it doesn't mean you need to go to, into straight panic and survival. It's like, how do you explain that to people? When to and when not? Or do you? Mm -hmm. I've started to explore this a little bit myself as well. I did a post on Instagram this week where I started to talk about it. I sort of said that if the tools you're working with are taking you five years to accomplish one goal, maybe the tools aren't so great. Like I know the whole concept of like not rushing horses and not trying to start them in 30 minutes, which was like super popular in the 1990s, but right. moved away from that. And we've swung the pendulum too far in the opposite direction towards this hyper patient, hyper long duration, super low activity style rehabilitation or training. And I hear that, but again, human nature is to go from one extreme to the other without pausing to take a breath in the middle. And most of the time, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I'm not advocating that people 
deliberately piss off their horses or deliberately frighten their horses or deliberately expose horses to traumatizing stimulus. This is not something we are doing. Mm -hmm. But I don't even see it that way. I'm not even coming to this this problem from that direction. I'm not even coming there from that space. Mm -hmm. When a horse expresses themselves in ways that make me feel uncomfortable Mm -hmm. or ways that a book says are uncomfortable, I don't see that as a failure. Mm -hmm. because I'm not reinforcing that. Mm -hmm. And if it's coming to the surface, then it's coming to the surface and we may as well deal with it. And if you're getting your horse to a certain point, for example, the the issue you said about threshold, bring them to the threshold and wait. Okay, great. But there has to be a change at some point. Mm -hmm. And when that change is going to happen is going to look different on different horses. And again, the answer is you've got to feel it. You Mm -hmm. can't look for environmental or behavioral stimuluses that give you permission then to do X, Y, Z. You've got to feel the readiness in the horse or not. And feel is not something you're born with and you can't teach bullshit. You don't Mm -hmm. have to teach it. You just help people remember what feel is. Right. You're not teaching it. People just have to remember it. You already have it. You've Um, it. (laughs) It's already there. It's in your body. If you have breath in your body, you've got feel. And I translate feel as how you feel, which is just emotional awareness. That's it. That's it. There's nothing mystical about it. It's emotional awareness. And there is a very rational explanation for all of that. But at what point does that kind of training become inertia? Mm -hmm. Inertia. When you're stuck. Mm -hmm. When you create a situation where you create a horse that's stuck on this one tiny needless detail. Mm -hmm. And sometimes Mm -hmm. your job, I think, as a trainer is to facilitate the cycle, but also interrupt a pattern, Mm -hmm. interrupt the pattern and present a new pathway and present a different approach and um, allow the horse to communicate in ways which make you feel uncomfortable. This is for professionals though. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that private horse people who are not training horses for others should get themselves into scenarios where they should be rehabilitating horses. They should do training to a certain degree, but rehabilitation should be done by professionals. I think a lot of private horse owners, they have the, the luxury to go out there and shop for a horse that's right for them. Mm -hmm. And you should wait until you find the right horse for you. Um, Try it out. And if it's not working, move the horse on and get one that's right for you. It's not your job to train it. You can get a trainer in, but is that horse right for you? Um, As a trainer, our job is to adapt ourselves to a variety of horses. Mm -hmm. That's what our job is so we should be adapting to all of these things but yeah i digress so how do i explain that to people um inertia and it's okay to kind of say come on come on let's get out of here right a little bit like people are going to say i'm anthropomorphizing but on an emotional level horses and humans are the same on an emotional level on an intellectual level we are not we are very, very divergent on an intellectual level. But in terms of emotional intelligence, emotional experience and uh, awareness, humans and horses are the same. So I'm not projecting or anthropomorphizing when I give this silly example of a depressed teenager who's stuck in the house and has a lot of potential, but just stuck there and they don't want to leave the house or go anywhere or do anything. Or you've got a friend that's just been stuck in a rut And you call them up and say, put your clothes on. Yeah. (laughs) I'm taking you out. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Put the computer games down, close Netflix. (laughs) I'm taking you out. Right. Right. And then they go, oh, I don't want to. You say, that's fine. Right. Put your clothes on. We're going out. You're going to have a great time. And we can do that for horses because some horses, especially domestic horses, are so stuck in these ruts, you know, way too homeostatic horse keeping environments they're just like yeah same shit every day okay same training session oh same tiny problem and i feel the same about it how i did yesterday Mm -hmm. and here we go they're bringing me right up to the threshold and then we stay there Mm -hmm. and then no other information is forthcoming Mm -hmm. and i'm supposed to figure out this puzzle on my own so no wonder it takes four years for these horses to for example trot without shaking their heads right so what if they trot and shake their head when they go and trot 
So what if they pin their ears when they collect themselves? Mm -hmm. This is where I come from, right? Emotion and movement is connected. In order for horses to express movement in very specific ways, they have to feel specific emotions that are connected to those movements. A lot of horses would never, never pee up naturally of their own volition. Right. Some horses will never, and yet they're being asked to do it like robots without feeling anything. But to a horse, that movement means something emotionally. They would never use that movement, perform that movement, unless they were using it to say or express something mm -hmm. from inside themselves. So PF as an extreme example, as a highly aroused behavior, would be done by stallions presenting themselves for a mare or stallions showing off to each other or you know, young horses in a high state of play or a foal discovering its legs for the first time saying, aren't I fierce, aren't I fabulous? And when you're training these horses, these emotions will come to the surface and some of them will be negative and some will be positive, mm -hmm. scientifically negative, positive. Horses don't put value judgment on those emotions. So you'll see a lot of horses who are piaffing in a dressage environment and their ears are back mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're pretend they are being in that moment Mm -hmm. The lustful, rageful stallion who is puffing himself right. up, presenting himself for war, mm -hmm. for battle, for covering mares. That's what he has to do. He has to feel that way in order to piaf, right? Yeah. But then people shame that rider and say, well, his ears are back and he's angry. He must be in pain. Well, he might be in pain and that's true. And a lot of dressage horses are, but if they're not, the rider is just allowing the horse to feel what they need to feel to do that movement. Why are we asking horses to perform movement in the absence of emotion like mm. robots? Because it makes us uncomfortable. Right. Or we allow the horse only to present movement in what we have decided is emotionally positive mm. uh, ways of expression. And I think that's so unhealthy and a form of toxic positivity. And that's projection on a horse, actually. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, horses can trot for a variety of different reasons. Horses can walk for a variety of different reasons. And um, if you ever find yourself with a horse that you want them to do specific movements, like you've decided you want to jump, you've decided you want to do mounted archery, you've decided you want to do whatever, you need to know that when you ask them for specific movements, and you're working in these spheres of allowing expression that certain things are going to come to the surface mm -hmm. that have nothing to do with you right. and have everything to do with the horse connecting authentically mm -hmm. to their movement and emotional system mm -hmm. movement memory and emotion swirl within the same part of the brain they're very closely connected they form neural connections in very similar areas I'm not a neuroscientist. This is a colloquial explanation here, right? But <clears throat> if you want horses to be expressionless robots, because that's what the science has said these movements mean, I think that's such a mistake and so misguided. You know, in order for my horse, for example, to collect himself, he has to rage. Because... Mm -hmm. If he was left to his own devices, he would never naturally <laughs> collect unless he was play fighting, which right. is rage and play at the same time. Mm -hmm. Or if he was in a high state of um, like mock panic, mm -hmm. like a play panic, mm -hmm. um, he would never naturally collect himself. So I don't ask him to collect and feel nothing while he does it. Right. Because that's just like empty movement. Right. I love that. Um that connection of, and it is so much like going back to the beginning of like dance and the expression and mm -hmm. watching someone. Mm -hmm. And it's like such an emotional and individual thing. Mm -hmm. And why are you telling somebody you should feel this way mm -hmm. about that? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And it. that was the genesis of my, my dance education from the real beginning. My teachers, I was really lucky. It's not normal. Mm -hmm. My teachers were very much like, okay, well, there's this movement. Let me teach it to you mechanically. Uh, you do this and you do that. But this movement has a name and mm -hmm. this name is um capriole for example which means like you know whatever it means in french or this this means plie which means to bend so there's something more to it than that or this one means you know to shade yourself so there's always this built-in expression especially within classical training mm -hmm. every movement has a built-in 
expression, not just mechanical output. And you see a lot of people, a lot of dancers who are trained only mechanically and they can do all of these wonderful things with their bodies, but it's, there's, they get on stage and they can't like mm -hmm. do anything with it. They can't mm -hmm. relay something in the dark across 2000 people to someone in the back row. They can't express or project it there. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with horses. They, when you see them move in nature, when you see them move without human interference, they move for a reason. And this reason isn't only to seek food mm -hmm. or sex or resources. Mm -hmm. That's not the only reason they move. They move for an infinitely number, an infinite number of complex reasons. And sometimes they move just to move, mm -hmm. just to express themselves, just to feel that way. So, so good. So we'll... Um... <laughs> <laughs> We'll wrap up with the question, you know, what is one of the most important things you ask yourself or mm -hmm. question about yourself or that brings you back into that introspective of yourself that might be helpful for people to try on? <laughs> mm -hmm. So we, I think this is the one I mentioned before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. Okay. The so top. the thing I always, I always ask myself is what do I not know that I don't know? Where is my point? of ignorance mm -hmm. where am i potentially ignorant where do i need to shine more light mm -hmm. and i gave you the the um analogy of like a um, uh, a lighthouse with the the roaming spotlight you can't illuminate everything at one time and don't expect yourself to know everything all the time you've only got one sort of sphere of awareness but that awareness is not fixed you can move it and it's dynamic so just keep it moving and keep asking yourself, what do I not know that I don't know? And for me, that's a built-in humility reflex mm -hmm. that allows me to stay safe around horses and not need to constantly fall off or get kicked or get thrown in order to like have a wake-up call that I was being arrogant or presumptuous with my training. I just constantly ask myself, in which areas am I stupid? In which areas could I be doing better? And what do I not know that I don't know? Mm -hmm. And I got that from my father. My father taught that to me. Mm -hmm. And I apply it not just to horses, but I apply it to as many areas of my life as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. We could obviously go on and on. Um, yeah. But I appreciate the time and I appreciate all no of the insight and, um, and just love, you know, being able to connect with other people that have such similar values and what we're doing so if people Did that yeah if people want to work with you um or learn more about what you do where do they go mm -hmm. so at the moment you need to find me on instagram or facebook um both of them are at emotional horsemanship emotional horsemanship um i'm working on a website i've been working on it for almost a year but i've been too busy like helping people that it's always the last thing on my list. So I'm, I'm still building my website, but it, it'll be ready by Christmas, I think. Yeah. Um, and the website is emotionalhorsemanship.com. So that's coming very soon. And that will have like a comprehensive menu of all of my services there. That's like in one place where everyone can kind of get there. But at the moment, find me. I'm most active on Instagram and then on Facebook. And I've got also like a private group on Facebook, which you can find there through my Facebook page you can join there and there I have like not publicly politically correct conversations with <laughs> my community so anything which might attract a Karen on Facebook I have it I have that conversation in a group with a smaller community of really really supportive people and I we I moderate it with like a few of my friends so we make sure there's no shame atmosphere there there's no like finger wagging there's none of that so you can find us there um, if you want to work with me, I've got two online courses on Udemy. Udemy, I don't know how to pronounce it. U D E M Y. Mm -hmm. One of them is a short course in emotional horsemanship that I made during the coronavirus lockdown. It's like a really foundational, basic first step in mm -hmm. emotional horsemanship. I outlay the principles of how I work with horses and the most important technique to me in working with horses, which I call mother fall bonding. And I, um, I work with um, instinctive body language phenomena that exists between mothers and their foals. Mm -hmm. And I replicate this in a training environment. Cool. 
to create a feeling of safety and trust between you and the, the rider. But it's more than just a trust exercise. You can actually use this technique to put the first saddle and the first rider on the horse as well. So it's kind of like the foundation of how I work mechanically. Mm -hmm. So you can find me there. I've got, I'm also a barefoot tremor and hoof care provider. So I've got a barefoot basics course on Udemy as well. Mm -hmm. And I coach people on how to trim, learn, teaching them how to trim their own horses. And I do that all online. Um, and if you want to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I have online coaching programs. They're really not expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and you just write to me on social media. And I, I literally read every message and respond to everyone. So that's where I am right now. But probably, again, within six months, I'll be embarrassed because I'll have something much more <laughs> slick and professional. But that's where I am right now at this, at this point. Perfect, amazing, wonderful. So thank you so, <laughs> so much. It's so good. So good. Yeah. And I think that Thanks. whole six months from now thing, it really gives people permission to grow, you know, and shift yeah. these heart set and beliefs that they had about something their entire life and then see something yeah. go, oh, these are yeah. professionals that are shifting like week by yeah. week. And it's like, yeah. and we should, we should. If you're meeting a professional, they're doing the same shit for the last yeah. 10 years in the same way. It's like red flag, like find your wallet, put your <laughs> hand on it and run. Don't walk away. You want to, I mean, I think maybe I'm wrong, but don't you want to find a professional who's also constantly evolving mm -hmm. so that they can coach you in the process of evolution? Don't mm -hmm. you want to find someone who's walked that talk, right. you know? Yeah. And like, again, you can wake up any moment any morning you can wake up and you can decide to do it differently that mm -hmm. day for no other reason or validation than you decided it that way mm -hmm. and you can do it differently yeah so yeah so good all right well thank you thank you thank you thank you for inviting me to this conversation i really appreciate it yeah it was good good fun <laughs>